Good. All right, so uh, let's just start. So let me say something, a bunch of different disclaimers. First, I'm not an expert on Rosa Zamerdi graphs. There might be some people who are. We don't understand them that much, but anyway, I'm not an expert. Most of the things I'm going to talk about are not my work. I'll tell you the general theme of things that we've heard. Okay, good. Second thing, I think I took the notion of the tutorial very seriously in the sense that don't think of this as a talk. For the next one hour and a half, you're in a class, basically. Stop me every five minutes, ask questions, OK? So you see, I don't have a slide. So I'm going to go over this board. And Zihan told me I have till like 8 or 9 or something. So we are here. Don't <laughs> worry. Like, good. OK. So all right. And it's a bit weird to use laser here. I needed one of these like tappy things. I don't have it. So, all right, so what are we going to do? Um, before anything, let, these are a bunch of applications. And, uh, and again, it's Zihan's fault. I wanted to write more, but I thought I'd blame him. So I wrote some of the papers that are relevant here. There are lots of things that I didn't get a chance to write. In his defense, I wasn't going to write them also. But like, so just roughly speaking, uh, there are a bunch of applications of RS graphs. I will talk about them during this talk. I'll come back here, talk about the references. If I use a shorthand like this GKK12, it is defined sometime earlier. OK, so good. So what is the plan of this talk? So I'm going to, this is, this is the plan, OK? And so let's just jump right away into, start defining what are these graphs. Uh, oh, I have to motivate. So the motivation is this thing. RS graphs are this type of graph that if they didn't exist, we would have been very happy. We could have used, like, we would have had lots of good algorithms. Okay. Uh, what does FOF? Number on forehead, which I realize, yeah, it may not be that common. Like, it might not be common knowledge. Number on forehead is a model of communication complexity that your input is written on your forehead. Everyone else sees it. It's an extremely hard model of communication to prove lower bounds in, because everything you do here will imply circuit lower bounds, and circuit lower bounds are scary. And you can use RS graphs in a, it's a very nice paper by Nogo Alon and Scheiberman, I think, that shows protocols there imply RS graphs, which conversely, you can think of it, pro, RS graphs imply lower bounds there. So, all right, so where were we? Yeah, so RS graphs, yeah, there are these type of graphs that, it, like Aaron, for instance, mentioned fault tolerant matching. Do we have Aaron here? We don't. Oh, yeah, good. So I will talk about like, how using RS graphs you can prove lower bound for them. Okay, good. They are really, yeah, these are these, they are either barriers or like formal proofs that something very nice that we would have liked to have, let's say matching a sparsifier doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because of RS graphs, okay? And toward later of this part, I hope to show you that this is in a very strong sense that um, there is some duality, basically. RS graphs are not only a sufficient condition, they are somewhat necessary in the sense that they are as hard as it gets. You can always get down to the complexity of RS graphs. Anyway, but let's just start defining a bunch of things. So induced matching. I will not define matching. We know what it is. But induced matching is so some m inside edges of uh, I'm going to use mostly bipartite graph. It's not that important. Everything works for general graphs with some more work. But let's use bipartite graph. So a matching m inside this graph, I'm going to call it induced matching. If it has the following property, if I look at the endpoints of the edges, okay, there are no other edge between its endpoints. Okay? In other words, if I look at the induced graph of G on vertices of M, that induced graph is just this matching. Okay? So if I have a graph at this point, this matching, if it is inside a larger graph, this is this large graph, at the moment, this is an induced matching, okay? Because if I look at 
endpoints of these vertices, there are no other edges other than the matching, okay? But if it so happens that my graph has this edge also, then this matching is no longer induced, okay? Because in the induced subgraph, it's not only the matching, this extra edge is there. Sounds good? Okay. So think about it. An induced matching is a very a sparse subgraph, no? If I have an induced matching of size R, I'm telling you that R edges are possible. R square minus R edges are no longer possible in your graph, okay? Or there are, for R edges, there are roughly R square non-edges in the graph. So induced matchings are very sparse, okay? Good. So now let's define RTRs graphs. Uh, RS graphs start, uh, let me write it once. These are Rosa's Ameridi graphs. Uh, yes, but from now on I'm going to just call them RS graphs. And they've been introduced by them in 1978. Good, okay. So what is, what are these graphs? A graph G, is RTRS graph if it has the following property. Edges, so G is again, G partitions into M1, MT. You can take edges of G and partition it into bunch of matchings, M1 to MT. Cardinality of MI is R. So each of them has R edges, and these are actually induced matchings. Okay, so these are induced matching. Good. Okay. This is an RTRS graph. There are two important parameters for me, R being the size of my matchings, and T being the number of matchings that I have. Okay? An RS graph, you can take its edges, write it as partition of T different induced matching, okay? These are induced again, and each of them have size R, okay? Sounds good? Okay. Do we only allow for the RT edges, or is the last one like a remainder? Um, let's say they always have size R. You can just throw out everything, or like, we are going to look at R and T asymptotically, so one matching, just throw it out, it doesn't matter, okay? Good. So let me draw one RS graph for you. <coughs> let's see if I can do it, actually. Um, This is so complicated. This, I'm trying to draw a hypercube, which we've drawn as kids <laughs> much easier. Yeah, this is like, I, I think this is a hypercube, okay? Uh, good, so hypercube is some sort of an RTRS graph. Let me show you one of its induced matching. Okay, so this is my graph. This is a three-dimensional a hypercube. Um, this is an induced matching. Pick edges that are somewhat on diagonal with respect to each other. This is one and this is another one. So one and one. Do you agree that these two form an induced matching? Okay, there are no other. This guy doesn't have an edge here and this guy doesn't have an edge here. Okay? And you can keep picking these things, you can pick six of this. Okay, good. So this is an example of an RTRS graph, okay? Um, so is, can we add a bluff? Like if you allow 
<laughs> so if R is one, a click is like as dense as it gets. Okay, and R here, that's a very good point that if I don't care about values of R that much, R equal one, every graph is an RTR scan. Okay, and T equal one, basically R has to be a matching, like as dense as it gets. Okay, good. So this brings us, so then when, when is it interesting? Like what choice of parameters make this thing interesting? We want both R and T to be very large. Okay, so what do we want? Um, So why we want to create dense RS graphs, okay? If you have a dense RS graph, or conversely, we don't want them to exist. But for this talk, we are going to look at, they, are in, they become interesting when both R and T are large. Okay, good. So why is this very weird in some sense? That why, like the first order intuition is that these things should not become dense. Okay. Remember, what was, an induced matching. An induced matching of size R, you put R edges, and for R edges, you have to put R square non-edges in your graph, okay? And you have many of these things. You put R edges, you are saying R square non-edges. Then another R edges, R square non-edges. So you are locally very sparse, no? These graphs, each of these things, you look, there's just R edges, whereas it could have been R square edges. Okay, but if I can make R and T both large, I'll get globally dense graphs. So locally they are sparse, but actually if I come and look back and like look at them from some distance, they're very dense. Okay. And that's the, that's the counterintuitive part. Okay, they should not exist, but, and just from this description, can someone tell me that this is not really a proof that it's problematic? Like, at this level of intuition, do you see why it is a still, it might be possible you can make them dense? So there could be a lot of edges between the, between the different matchings. Yeah, the non-edges can be shared between these induced matchings, okay? M1 comes with R square non-edges, and maybe those R square non-edges are being shared a lot by many of them, okay? If that happens, then there is at least a hope to create something which is dense. Sounds good? Okay, good. So we are going to look at these things and talk more about them in this talk. Uh, one thing, let me just write here. R S of R and N. Um, I'll try to uh, stick to this convention that I have a bipartite graph, left has n vertices, right has n vertices also, okay? Uh, I may forget about that, just remind me. So this is n, this is n. So my graph has two n vertices. And when I write Rs of R and n, n refers to this thing. So I'm talking about bipartite graphs with n vertices on the left, n vertices on the right. And this quantity is the maximum density of RTRS graph. Oh, uh, dense like R times T, maximum number of edges. Okay, density is number of edges. So this is a quantity that I want to understand. Okay, I want this. I want to know how large this thing can be. Does it sound good? Okay. R is fixed here, N is fixed, so basically I want to maximize T. Okay, and uh, when I maximize it, this quantity becomes R times T. Good, okay. So, perfect. 
So at some point I will write a table of the things we know about RS graphs, but that will be for a bit later. Let's talk about trivial RS graphs at the moment. Does anyone have any question at this point? Okay. So let's do a simple observation. Um, I, in the back, you can see what I'm writing. No, like I'm good. So observation: uh, R s of R and n is at least omega of n square over R. Okay, this is trivial. Okay, this is really trivial. It's just an exercise in figuring out what was the definition. But before that. Let's just see two regimes that this thing give us. R equal one. R equal one, it tells that Rs of R and N can be N square. You agree with that, no? A click is the example. R equal N, okay? This tells us that the graph can have N edges. Well, just pick a matching, okay? How can I interpolate for all values of R? Disjoint matchings in what way? So put, let's say n over r here. Each of them have size r. So r vertices, r vertices, r vertices, n over r group. Put a perfect matching here, perfect matching here, and so on and so forth. I have n over r, so here t will become n over r squared. You agree? Okay. Why do I say this is trivial? Not just because it's easy to create, because it is not using the magical power of RS graphs. The magical power is that you can actually share non-edges. This construction is not doing that. Okay, your non-edges are also unique to the matching. Okay, good. So this construction actually does not do much. But even this construction at this level allows you to prove something. Okay, there are this lower bound by, oh, okay. Let me just write it here, Conrad 15 uses a very nice way of just using these graphs, this level, to prove lower bounds for finding matchings in dynamic streams, okay? And this was improved by using like a more general RS graphs in a paper we had with Sanjeev and Yang Li and Grigory Yaroslotsev to get the optimal bounds for the problem, okay? Good, so good, so we are okay with this. Uh, Non-edges non are pair of vertices that don't have an edge in my graph, okay? So look at here, there is a matching of size r, and there are r square minus r pairs of vertices that have no edges between them. Refer think of red edges as non-edge, okay? Non-edges are edges of the complement graph. These non-edges are actually all of them here. Okay, are dedicated to this pair. And this other pair is using a new set of non-edges. Okay, so non-edges are not being shared, even though definition allows me to actually share them. Okay, good. All right. So that was the trivial construction. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, are there any shared non-edges in that hypercube? There are, yes. Can you, like, can uh, you Any chance you can take my word for it and then I'll do it at the end? Like, uh, there are, I, I can give you a reason. I'm not 100, I think there are here. Hmm? There are, okay, let's do it. This one, yes. This non-edge should be also shared with 
this guy. So do you see this non-edge? Yes. This is shared by this induced matching as well. OK, good. And you need, like, these graphs in generality have more edges than what the trivial bounds give you even. OK, so with definition, they need to share some non-edges. OK, good. Any other question? OK, perfect. So, so we talked about this was the trivial bound. Now let me do something. Let's, so we are here. Where were we? So we talk about definition. We talk about RS graph. Let me, before showing you non-trivial construction, let me talk about why these graphs can be barriers. Okay? And then we'll come back and see how to create non-trivial RS graph. So let's go. Hmm. So Aaron defined fault tolerant matching. So let me use RS graph to give you lower bound for fault tolerant matching. Okay, you can use them to prove lower bounds for matching a sparsifier and things like that. Let me use here, so fault tolerant. Fault tolerant match. Let me define the problem, you've seen it. Trivial upper bound for it? Yeah, N squared. <laughs> no, I'm not saying it as a joke. This is it, like really. Like, and uh, there are non-trivial upper bounds, uh, a small of N squared. I'll get to those. Like, good. If you are, if you start, if you, if I force you to not share non-edges, then this is the upper bound as well. This is what you probably good. Okay, so let's talk about fault tolerant matching. You've seen the definition. Let me just do it very quickly again. You have a graph G. Okay, you want to pick H such that for all f subset of G, E of G, edges of G. Let's write it. Cardinality of f equal f, mu of g minus f is the same roughly as mu of h minus f. Okay, mu was maximum matching size. Okay, so take your graph, pick some subgraph h, such that whenever I delete up to f edges, if I delete them from g or h, size of the matching remains roughly the same. Okay, good. So Aaron showed us how to get a three half approximation. Let me show you why three half might be the right answer here. Not might, I mean it is the right answer, okay? But for now, let's just think of why RS graphs are giving us like a barrier or like why you should think of RS graph as like when you want to prove this lore. So think of this thing. Some parameters are as R of T on capital N vertices. So this part is an RS graph, okay? And this part is a perfect match. So suppose this is your input graph. So there is an RS graph sitting in the middle, okay? And then there is this part and this part. And these two are matching. Now suppose, so you take this graph, okay? And let's say this RS graph also have capital M edges. Good. So you have this graph, you are picking H. H has to be a bit sparser. So for, the, for now, let's just say that H has a small of M edges. So you did something non-trivial here. There were capital M edges. You managed to sparsify just a bit to get a small of M edges. Sounds good? OK. If you do this thing, if you are compressing the graph by a small of one factor, and if 
this graph is a collection of bunch of induced matchings. It's a partition of induced matching. Do you agree that from one of those induced matching, you should have only picked a small of one fraction of the edges? No? Basically, I'm saying this thing, summation of i equal 1 to t, cardinality of mi intersection h, is a small o of m. Good? So if I change this thing by expectation, expectation of i chosen randomly from t, this thing become m divided by t. Um, sorry for writing here. I will not write here afterwards. OK? Like, this is a partition. I'm not even using inducedness or anything. It's a partition. If you compress all of it by a small, to a small of one factor, each of those matching annex, like a random matching, will be compressed by a small of one factor also. So what does it mean? It means that for most of these induced matchings here, you only picked a small o of r edges. OK, so let's fix one of them. This is an induced matching. You picked a small o of r edges. So far, everyone is on board or is sleeping. Like, be in one of these two states. Like, good. <laughs> so this one? Good. So what was your like solution? Green or orange? Good. Okay. So so there are small of R edges here. Okay. Now let's look at you know this is supposed to be fault tolerant. Okay. So let's say my deletion was this. Let's say I remove these R edges here incident on this blue part and I remove these R edges here incident on this blue part. Okay, those are the edges that I delete. So my F is 2R. What will happen to this graph? Okay, what does G have? G has a matching of N minus R here, has a matching of R here, has a matching of N minus R here. And this is the largest matching you can get. Why well, you can do a vertex cover argument, for instance. Okay? These vertices, this, and this form a vertex cover of the graph. Okay? Good. So G has a matching of mu of G minus F, has size 2n minus 2r plus r. Good? Okay. What about mu of H minus F? Well, you only have a small of r edges here, OK? All your other edges are incident on these vertices, this one and this one, OK? So you cannot get a large matching. The largest matching you get is 2n minus 2r plus a small of r, OK? There is roughly an additive of r gap between the two matchings. OK, we are good with this? OK, good. So let's see what does this tell us. Like, what would be a reasonable value for r we want to pick? OK. Um, let's do an educated guess of picking r to be n over 2. So let's say r is n over 2. OK. Why do I want to pick r equal n over 2? Because that's the point that I have roughly a three, three half gap between these two values. OK. At r equal n over 2, this guy is roughly n. This guy is 3n over 2. OK. So there is a gap of n over 2 there. OK. So, but what does this quantity? Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, did you pick a set f in particular here? So, uh, yes. Sorry, what is my we, f? We yeah, sorry. So I look at how you compress this graph. Yes. OK. One of your induced matchings, you've hit it by a small of one factor. You only have a small of r edges there yeah. by this argument. F is you look at the endpoints of that matching, and you remove this. Like, this was a perfect matching. You remove this side and this side. OK? Good. Good. So, so you'll come here. We'll pick r to be n over 2. Okay. 
Now, what do we learn? We learn that if I want to have a fault-tolerant matching algorithm for this R equal n over 2, the number of edges that I need has to be more than the density of this RS graph. Has to be proportional to density of this RS graph. Okay? Which means what? Which means this is not. Oh, it moves. Perfect. It means that 3 over 2 fault tolerant matching with f equal, let's say, theta n needs rs of n over 2 and n edges. Omega of that, omega of one time. Does this make sense? This is, this is, we proved this already. Okay, good. Now, now let's plug in this bounder. Okay. What do I get if I plug in that bounder? It's just going to tell me that I need omega n edges. No? So, trivial bound. So, here. Trivial bound will tell me I need omega n edges. So what? It means nothing to me, no? Because there, there was no, of course I need omega n. I'm deleting omega n edges from the graph. This is completely useless, okay? But why this is useless? Not because of like how the, the proof of structure, everything is completely sound. Okay, we just plug in the, like the first bound we find for RS graph here. Okay, so in principle, if I come here and pick something which is not as trivial as this, then I might be able to improve that bound. Not that I might be, anything I get here will immediately improve that bound. Sounds good? Okay. Anything better than three halves, yes. It's strictly better than three, by constant. Three half itself will get it. Okay, it is CS does. But the moment you want a bit better, you have to at least handle this RS graph. No? Good? Okay. So now this is something that uh, I've heard by different accounts of like when pe how people came up or um, like in more recent years, how did RS graphs come up into picture? Um, one paper is, for instance, this paper of Ashish Goel, Michael Koprolov, and Sanjeev Kana. Um, is you would come up, like you do your research, you'll get up in a situation like this. You'll say that, oh, there's this graph. This is the only barrier possible. Then you're like, of course such a graph cannot exist. I mean, how such, that type of a weird graph should not exist. And then you will spend some time trying to prove it doesn't exist. And then eventually you realize, oh, there are these very weird looking graphs. Okay, um, so I want to tell you that these graphs exist. Okay, so when you are going through this route, maybe it will save you like a month, for instance, than <laughs> not trying to prove they do not exist. They actually exist. Okay, and I'll try to show you the proof of how, like, how they'll come into picture. But here, okay, so you'll do this thing, you'll say that, okay, in this case, I mean, such a graph hopefully doesn't exist. So then I'll get a good fault tolerant matching algorithm, at least based on this example, okay? Let's go over some construction that show you something like this, actually. You can do some, good. Okay, so let's just do one other thing here because it may be more relevant to our example I want to show you. Suppose I wanted an additive approximation. No, I, let, let me do the construction first, then I'll come back. Good, okay, so, so we are here. All right, we are here. We are talking about some non-trivial RS graphs. Uh, I'm going to erase this, we don't need this anymore. Any question up until here? 
if you are trying to show lower bounds for fault tolerant matchings, then isn't it, I mean, wouldn't it be possible that you are able to get fault tolerant matchings, but only if f is much smaller than n over 2, or something like that? I mean, why is this the interesting regime for? Uh, oh, so first, fault tolerant matching is usually interesting when f is much larger than n. Okay, because the type of bound we want are usually n plus f. You need n because you have to maintain a matching of size n in your graph anyway. And you need at least f because f is like you are removing f edges. Okay, so, so usually the benchmark for fault tolerant matching is a graph that has n plus f edges. Okay, and because of that f less than n is not that interesting. Most of the application, for instance, in dynamic matching, takes f to be roughly n to the 1.5. Okay. Good. Any other question? Good. All right. So let's do a, a non-trivial construction. I'm going to show you the construction of Rosan's MRD. This is again Rosan. Ready from 78. Uh, with some simplification, I'll get a slightly worse path. Okay? So, what do they do? The, their theorem RTRS graph, or rather, let's say RS of N and R is larger than. <coughs> Omega n square 2 to the square theta square root log n. Okay, this became very. So, what? Oh, okay, this is. My notation, this is this. Okay, what is this? They are creating RS graph that have induced matchings of size slightly less than n. n divided by 2 to the square root log n. Okay, so this is the size of induced matching. Okay, R is n divided by 2 to the square root log n. Sounds good. Very large match, almost linear. Okay, and the graph has almost n square edges. Yes, exactly. So this is a large number of edges, but not a positive density. Okay? So let me actually, I wanted to mention that, so let's just do it now. So Alon, Moitra, and Sodokov from 12 have R n to the 1 minus a small of 1. This is really a very large constant. You can, it's, it's a constant, okay? So a bit smaller than this, but an arbitrary small constant, okay? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, this is two to the square root log n, really. That one, like, think of it as n to the one minus epsilon for epsilon going to zero. Okay, so the matching size are smaller. Okay, like n to the 0 0.99, that type of a thing. But R times T is equal to N choose 2. These are non-bipartite. Okay, for bipartite, this doesn't make sense. Minus a small O of N square. Extremely dense graph. This is just a clique, basically. And you're removing some tiny edges from it. And it's still an RS graph. Okay, good. So. For a second, ignore this thing. Already there is an extremely magical thing happening here. Okay. What is going on? I'm picking an induced matching of size almost n, and my graph has almost n square edges. What did the trivial bound imply here? The trivial bound implied that we have almost n edges. The trivial bound says that you have n to the 1 plus a small of 1 edges. They are saying you actually have almost n square edges. 
Okay, so you can put a graph to be very, very dense. Okay, and uh, yes, there is this construction later on by Alan Moitra and Sodokov that says not only very dense, this is extremely dense. This is like you, you know, like you are further away from a click by some a small of one factor. Okay, but the size of matching has to be slightly smaller. Okay, so good. Um, I was. For a long time, I thought this is very complicated, but I was looking at it today again after like a while. This is not that bad. Like uh, this is actually very nice. And uh, the bad part is I have no idea why would someone come up with that construction. They say that this is they following up some other work of Fox and someone else. And I think if you chase down that, you'll probably eventually get the intuition why people came up with that construction. But once you see the construction, verifying it is not hard. Okay. Good. But we are going to look at this. I want to give you almost the entire proof of this thing, okay? Because it's very simple, in fact. Can I ask, like, you know, in the low value, you need R to be roughly M. So does this thing translate into the low value? Yeah. Good. Okay. That's a very good one. This, at the moment, will not tell me anything there, okay? Uh, for that, we need a different type of R scrap. Uh, their construction are much harder. So I will uh, start by this, and then I'll hand wave my way through that. It is actually a bit more complicated than their proof, because they're using a black box, using arithmetic progression-free integers. I want to not use that. I want to just do it through vectors. Okay, by proving arithmetic progression free vectors. In vector world, that theorem is very easy to prove. Okay, um, but it will be a bit weaker because they'll get a slightly larger number of matchings. In this notation, uh, I'll hide it through this theta so it won't become apparent at all. Okay, good. So let's prove this thing. Any question about this? Uh, We've talked enough about induced matching. This things you remember this thing. No, I'm going to erase it. Like it's Zion, how much time do I have? Or oh, Prantar, sorry. Officially or like? <laughs> okay, good. So, oh. okay. good. So we're proving that theorem. I want to show you this construction. Okay, uh, let's go through some exercise. So, I'm going to have two parameters, p and d. And I look at this vector a space of p to the d. These are d-dimensional vectors with integers from 1 to p. Okay? And I'm not even going to use it as a field or anything. Like, think of it as a lattice. Like it's, uh, I'm not doing anything fancy with that. Okay, good. And p roughly is going to be 2 to the square root log n. And d roughly is going to be a square root log n. Everything that I'll say works for every choice of these parameters, okay? That's the optimized choice. Okay, good. So, how do we create these graphs? Do the in fact, let's prove a bunch of things here about this uh, space, and then we'll use it to create the graph, okay? Claim one. There exists a subset of p to the d. So, I can pick a bunch of vectors from p to the d with these two properties. One, they all have the same norm. Their L2 norms are the same, okay? What is L2 norm summation of AI square? Okay, I equal one to D. So they all have the same length, okay? Two, A is large, okay? is larger than p to the d, d p square. 
I can pick tons of vectors from this uh, space. All of them have the same norm. OK, can someone prove this? Where was it? OK, good. How do you do it? So the maximum of two norm is all of them will be equal to P. And uh, we have P to the D. This side of the space is P to the D. At least one. So what are L2 norms of these vectors? The, very, the smallest value, you, you can have the all one vector. It's L2 norm is D. And you have the all P vector. It's L2 norm S square is D P S squared. OK? So L2 norm can ranges between D and D P S squared. OK? There are only these many choices of the value for L2 norm of vectors here. You have p to the d vector, so one of these layers should have that many vectors inside it. Sounds good? OK. Exactly. If you pick randomly, you can even uh, slightly get better bounds than that. That's true. Like the average is the right number to pick. Yes. Um, these vectors have a arithmetic progression uh, free property. Pick three vectors, OK, such that A is not the same as B or C. B and C can, no, they're all different. Sorry. They're distinct. A, B, and C are distinct. Pick three different vectors here, OK? Some of two of them cannot be the same as twice of one of them, or like, one of them, you cannot get it as the average of two of them, OK? This is called, uh, like, you don't have a three-term arithmetic progression inside it, OK? Good. Can someone tell me why this is true? Say that again. Look at this two. Look at A. These are vectors that all have the same norm. So you are, if, look at moving to a step in the direction of A. Where does it take you? You are moving through one particular direction for two steps, okay? This is one, this is the other, one the same length. B and C are not the same, but they have the same length. So when you are moving, you are taking some, there is some angle between them. Look, A is taking you like this, with the same length toward one particular direction, OK? If you go from here by B, C is not long enough to bring you all the way to here. What is this proof Cauchy-Schwarz, OK? Like this is like the tightness of Cauchy-Schwarz, basically. Does this make sense? No, it's, for now, don't worry about it. Don't do mod or anything. If they become larger than that, they'll become larger. OK? Good. All right. And just a historical note, the way Rosa Zameridi proved that result is that these things happen, hold for integers also. There are large sets of integers that do not have three term These AP things, they use that to create the graph. But for our way, we can just use vectors directly. OK? Good. So B and C can be equal. Uh, B and C can be equal even if they are not the same as A. You are right. I mean, yeah, yeah but the, yes, you are right. Uh, I mean, this is true, but uh, I know what you are saying. Like, good. So. So we have these two properties. Let's use them to prove our data. So this is, let's erase here, and let's erase here. So how do you create this graph? 
uh, put 2p to the d here. And I'm being very lazy with this construction. You don't need to put such large numbers. Like I'm throwing a bunch of factors. But let the vertices on the left side be this set, 2p to the d. And vertices on the right sides are 3p to the d. Okay? So your graph is a bit lopsided. It doesn't matter. This is n for me. If you want, just pad this part with lots of empty vertices. Okay? Vertices that are not connected to anything. Okay? So. Then look at p to the d. So these are my vertices. These are not vertices anymore. These are some abstract things. So write p to the d here. I want to define my matchings. Okay? Pick one of these vertices. Pick one of these points. Okay? Move with everybody in a, a1 in a, all the way to a capital A in a. So you pick one of these points. And you move with all of those vectors to here. OK? So you are at capital A vector. Now I want to define edges of my graph. I want to define my matchings. OK? This is my matching edge. From here, move with A1. From here, move with A, A. And you'll get here. Yes, add the vector. So this matching for each point here, my matchings are for all x in p to the d. I have mx is a matching between set of vectors that are, I don't know, here this is x plus a and x plus 2a for all a in a. These are my matchings. And I added, I made this 2p to the d, so there is no like roll, I don't know what it's called. Like, you, you, you'll fit when you do the addition, it fits in this space. Sounds good? So these are the definition of my matching. So I have p to the d matchings. So t is p to the d, and r is p to the d divided by d p squared. If you look at those parameters that I told you, this is going to give us these bounds. OK, good. OK, so far good. But so I just defined the graph. Why are, why are these induced? Is the definition of the graph clear? Good. Can someone tell me why this graph, these are induced matchings? Yes, but why exactly? I mean, every, every matching edge is on a straight line from the origin. Yes, yes. Or let's look at it this way. So suppose it is not induced. OK, what does it mean? It means that there is this one. So if it is not induced, it means that there is an edge like this here. OK? Somebody added this edge. Some other matching added this edge. This edge, how much it moves you, it moves you according to some c in a, OK? And a will bring you by some b here. So you were here. By some b, you came here. You didn't move with the same b. If you were moving with the same exact b, then this would have been an edge of this matching, OK? So, so you are not moving with b. So you are moving with something else. So you came here with B, and you move with something else. But at the same time, this something else, you could have gone from here by A plus A. That cannot happen because of the second property we had. Okay? This point is 2A a step away from here. Okay? This point is X plus 2A. But we are also saying it is X plus B plus C which means 2a is equal to b plus c. That cannot happen. Good? Yes. 
Someone else added? That's comp I mean, this thing is, has been added because of some other C here. That's true. But this vertex, I mean, what does inducedness mean? It means that somebody brought you here. Okay. I'm not saying this edge was not added because you added this and then you decided to add this. But this is a vertex of this matching. So there is someone from here that can take you here. That is what I'm calling B. So that's a good question. It, the short answer is no. Not only the recent ones. Um, yeah, so, OK, let me repeat the question. There is a recent breakthrough by Rahul Mecca and I forgot the second author's name that prove upper bounds on density of these three term arithmetic progression free integers. Um, that shows something along these lines is the right answer for just if you wanted to have a bunch of integers with that property, okay? And then the question is, so can those upper bounds imply something on the density of these graphs? Uh, no, they, they will imply that this construction we cannot improve it much further, but nothing beyond that. Not, imp not only this recent improvement, like a, in 2015 and 16, there were this log improvement even those log improvements do not imply anything here, okay? Because in graphs, maybe there is an entirely different way of creating these things. But like, wave one is only for establishing there's a large enough AP free set. Like, like, in the sense you can keep, like, omit claim one and just use standard AP free results. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's how, like, Rosa and Zamerity didn't do any of this thing. They just said, that, like, they took Barron's construction and then just plug it in and work with it. Barron's construction starts with this and turn this thing into integers. And I'm saying that let's just create everything. This is completely elementary now. You don't have to know anything. You just start from here. You shortcut the step that take the vectors and make them integers. You don't need it here. Okay, but you're completely right. Uh, Alon, Moitra, Sudokov construction are not based on these things. All right, question. yes. I have the same question that I just asked. Why does the green edge have to exist? So what is this vertex? So first, uh, this is a good question. What is the question also? Why, if I got it con correctly, why there is an edge from here to here, which is B? It's, OK, good. So if this is not an induced matching, some vertex here that belongs to M of x, has an edge to some other vertex. By definition of this vertex belonging to M of X, somebody from X should bring you here. Okay, good. All right, questions? When do you use the first property of the one? Oh, just to say this. So then to prove that they are arithmetic progression free. I mean, that quantity is not true if all the norms are not equal. We need all the norms to be equal to say that you have to just move in like particular. Because if one of them is much longer than the others, like you can. Good. All right, yes. So the question is, is it intuitive? What are the non-edges that are being shared? I think that's an excellent question. I don't even know the answer, not even non-intuitive answer or anything. I've not thought about it, honestly. Like, what are the ones that are being shared here? Uh, we can think. I imagine lots of, the, like, there are lots of other matchings that will use this. Uh, yeah, I don't know what is, like, their description or what would be even a clever answer to give. Like pictorially, there is someone else that will come here and use one of these, and that non-edge is shared here, something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't. That's a good. So the definitions of your intermediate sets are 
like I tried to parse the notation. It's not two. It's not quite two p, but it's the sum of two vectors. Like it's all possible sums of two vectors in. Exactly. What I'm saying. Just just place two p to the d. This is a super set of that. No. Okay. I'm saying don't even. Be, you are completely right. And that set is a smaller than this. Okay, but just throw in everything, it doesn't matter. Good. Should I be worried that like the number of vertices is not like ten on each side, but like ten times two? So this is an, a small of one, like n to the small of one factor. No, d is a square two, like d is a square root log n. If you want to make them equal, just put. And now they're equal, like put a bunch of singleton vertices. You have enough a slack. Okay? So I guess I'm not, I'm not so worried about the equal so much as like n is not the number of vertices. n is 3p to the d. No, it is. Like if, if you move those things around a bit by just changing the constant okay. behind 2 to the square root log n, that's why this is theta. Like make that log, the square root log n divided by 3 or something. Yes? Uh, this gives unconditional lower bound for fault tolerance matching, but for one minus 6 of 1 across. Perfect. What, exactly. what is the best known unconditional lower bound then uh, for fault tolerance matching based on the construction? I'll get to that in a second. Okay, perfect. So let me just repeat what Sean was saying is that, look, I cannot use it here. This construction I cannot use here for 3 over 2 approximation. Why? Because the matchings I have are much smaller than n over 2, OK? But I can use it to get some lower bound. It basically says that if you want 1 plus 1 over 2 to the square root log n approximation, you need n square size, almost. OK? Now let's go to that question. So I need one other. So I'm going to erase this thing. So far, we focused on super dense RS graphs with large induced matchings, but not too large, OK? So now I want to write another theorem. I'm going to erase this. Everybody's OK? Good. OK. So let me write here. Fisher, Norman, Rosenfeld, Two. All right. Okay. So, Fisher, Newman, Rosenkova, Robin Field, and okay. So I don't know the correct pronunciation of the last name. Uh, I let's skip that. Okay. Good. So, in 2002, they gave a different construction theorem. It's a very very nice construction and quiet. Uh, non-trivial to get something like this, n over 3, very, very large matchings now, OK? On n vertices is n to the 1 plus omega 1 over log log n. So you can have very large matchings, induced matchings of size n over 3, roughly. OK? Remember, you have n vertices on the left, n vertices on the right, n over 3, and you have this quantity. OK? This is an actual construction, not in conditional or anything. You can get this. This is this many. How much is this? Think about it as what is n to the 1 over log log n? n to the 1 over log log n is the same as 2 to the log n divided by log log n. 2 to the log n would have been some polynomial in n. You're just making it a slightly subpolynomial. 
This is much larger than 2 to the square root log n, much larger than any poly log n. So this bound is much larger than n poly log n. You can have very, very large induced matchings and still get super linear, like uh, more than n poly log n edges. Okay, so there is this construction. And in fact, there is a follow-up, or there was a follow-up, this J GKK12 paper that I said there, that says this is uh, minus a small of n is the same thing. So n over 3 is not magical. You can actually make it all the way to n over 2. n over 2 is magical, like you cannot go above this. If you go slightly above this, we know that you cannot pack such dense graphs. These are bipartite graphs. The thing is that whenever you have a, uh, one direction is like whenever you have a general graph, it's bipartite double cover is an RS graph. So you, uh, you can always get the bipartite from general graph. Okay. And for the most part, the density doesn't matter really, except for those type of like alone Microsoft of that the density is so high that you want to differentiate between that. That's an excellent question. So what is the right answer here? Okay. I don't think there is a consensus. Okay. I might be wrong. I think Sohail, if we have him somewhere. We don't have him. Oh, we have him. He may know more. Like, you can talk with different people who have worked on this. Like, good person will be Jacob Fox to check these things in. Uh, the consensus is that it's an extremely hard question, okay? Whether, like, somebody conjectures you go here or there, I don't know. Okay. So now that we said it, what is, uh, like, first, let's take this construction, okay? What does it imply here? This is the bound we wanted, no? This is RS of n over 2, roughly, okay? And now this construction, actually tells me that my fault tolerant matching graph needs to have at least way more than n poly log n edges. Okay, that's non-trivial, that's what we wanted really, okay? There is no good fault tolerant graph because of such a construction. Okay. Um, I was extremely ambitiously planning to show you this construction also, and nowhere I can do it. So if you want, come talk to me after this, I can, hand wave myself through like how this thing works. It's not that bad. Again, this are some of these things I used to think they're really bad. And then, and then I realized, no, I was bad. I mean, they're really good. This is not hard if you think about it. OK, good. So, so you can get this. Okay. But there is some other question here we have to ask. At this point, I was showing you there are these constructions, and they'll get something. And but there, I showed you the hypercube one. If you think about that, that's a very, uh, not easy, that's an exercise. I think I gave it in the exercise. To use that to get this thing except with n log n edges. Okay, already you are beating the trivial bound. Okay, um, that's not hard uh, now that you saw that hypergraph on, three vert on eight vertices. You can generalize it to any value and get n log n edges out of it. But let's talk about something here quickly. So, so these are constructions. Okay. But you may have heard like a couple of people are asking, what do we think is the right answer? Where are, like, um, this is one construction. And like earlier, people were asking, what is a trivial upper bound? So let's answer that a bit also. If I write here, you'll all see it. Oh, good, good, OK. So let's look at. I'm going to focus on the case when r is theta of n, OK? For m the other cases have tons of applications also. Most of these things that I've written, they all involve actually r to be much smaller, OK? But for the top part that I'm talking about, this top set of results, for the most part, they'll get their, like, they either need r to be theta n 
or the most interesting regime for them is R equal to time. Okay, so let's say in the theme of this workshop, like modern graph algorithms, or like implication of RS graph for many of the things that people in audience work with, it's usually for when R is the time. Okay, it's a vague informal statement. So for R equal theta n, what do we know? So the best construction says something like this. Uh, R equal n over 2, then t equal theta log n. If R is exactly n over 2, you can have n log n edges, and that's tight. If R is more than n over 2, t is a constant. This is, an, this is an exercise, okay? Yes? Yes. The upper bound of this is by using coding theory, using the fact that random, like coding theory is just, in this context, is that you use this Corradi's lemma that bound the intersection of random sets. Okay, like random sets have the, forget the random. This is, this is a concept, it's a simple implication of things from coding theory, good? R less than N over four, okay? Now, what do we know? Now the answers are this. We know T can be more than N to the one over log log N. So it's like a bit more than polylog, or like a lot more but not polynomial. What is the upper bound here? Okay, what, how large can, like what is the best upper bound we can prove here? For general values of, think of this really as this upper bound that I give you hold for all, all the R equal theta n. T has to be less than n divided by two to the log star of n. Let me emphasize what is going on here. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, yes. N over two for us. In the literature, we're saying as N over four when N is the number of vertices of the graph. Here we have N and N. So the best upper bound for this regime is N divided by two to the theta of log star N. Okay, it's just tiny less than n. Okay, we just know that the graph cannot be like absolutely dense. It doesn't have a positive density. Okay, it's just, you can shave off something. Okay, and uh, to know where these bounds come from, this is coming from Fox 11 triangle removal lamp. Okay, so I hope you can appreciate the gap we have between these two. Our construction gives us something slightly more than polylogan. The upper bond says that you know it cannot be everything. It's, it's tiny bit better than everything, okay? And even to get this thing, you have to use this breakthrough of Fox on triangle removal lemma. A slightly easier proof is to use the Meredith regularity lemma and get n divided by some polylog star n. That, that one is not that hard. I mean, even this one, once you have triangle removal lemma, this is an easy thing to prove. Okay, good. For a slight, like close to here, n over two to roughly n over, I don't know. Uh, don't quote me on the exact constant. Very close to n over two. You can do t has to be less than n divided by log n. So you can shave off a log factor, okay? And if you make this thing even a bit closer, you can add this two to the log star n here as well. This is the state of the art, like the, on the upper bond side or on the lower, I mean, there's, there's this huge gap between the two, 
okay? And some of the things that are scary, even the best triangle removal lemma, I mean, even if you get the conjecture lower bound for triangle removal lemma, that is only going to shave off some iterated log, log log, log n, or log n. Okay, so, so this is the state of the art. Which side is the answer? I don't, I'm not an authority to say anything on that part. The thing is that for me, these things give a very serious barrier, okay? You may see this type of conditional lower bound in the literature. Like we don't know what is density of R S graph. Let's assume it is something. You prove a lower bound based on that. Two things happen. Either, either this condition, this assumption you made was correct, you have an actual lower bound. It is not correct, well, any, algorithm that is breaking the bounds you want is changing these numbers, okay? And that's enough breakthrough for me, really. Or like enough barrier to say that like what you are trying to solve might be really hard. Does this make sense? Good. All right, any question here? So Prantor, how much time do I have now? Good. So let, then I want to talk about one other thing. We've talked about everything here except for this dual of RS graphs, okay? I think it will be nice to see there are these algorithmic thing that more recently, I mean, the dual part is not recent. It's a result already in this GKK paper, but, uh, ah, okay, that does not feel good. But more recently, we've been using that way to actually design algorithms. So far, I was showing you RS graph as some sort of lower bound construction. This dual view allow you to use this very meager upper bounds to get algorithms. Let's say you'll get a fault tolerant matching graph which has these many edges. Okay, I, we don't have it, by the way, for fault tolerant. We have it for a streaming algorithms or like some dynamic graph problems, like dynamic matching, okay? The bounds you get are based on these things, okay? So slightly better than the absolute trivial bound. Um, good, so, so we want to do that. I think the nice thing for me is that they show not only RS graph or lower bounds, they are the core of the problem, basically. Like if you can solve them, you've solved the problem. So let's look at this dual view. I'm going to erase all of this. So let's define this notion of a matching cover. Um, Rosa's Ameridi graphs for some extremal graphs or some graph construction. Matching covers, think of them as a spanners, a sparsifiers, things like that. For any graph G, I want to pick a subgraph H with the following property that for all A and B subset of G, think of, so G was a bipartite graph. I have A here, B here. H has this property, these ones such that mu of G of A, B is larger than alpha. So look at some, look at any subset of vertices such that there is a matching of size alpha and between them, okay? H has one edge between A and B. If in G, there was such a large matching. H has at least one edge. What does it mean? Look at any large matching inside G, okay? Matching of size alpha. In H, you've picked one edge between its endpoints. 
It may not be edges of the matching, okay? But whenever you have a large matching, and this alpha is like the quality of the sparsifier, or the quality of the cover. For any large enough matching, you pick one edge between its endpoints. That's what I call an alpha matching cover. Does this sound good? So an alpha matching cover is this thing. For every large matching in your graph, large matching is a matching of size alpha n, in the cover, you pick one edge between its endpoints. Do you see why this is a good construction? What is a good property of edge? Edge is a subgraph of G, yes. H is subgraph of G. If I have a subgraph like this, do you see what are some good properties of edge? Like for instance, what is the difference between maximum matching size in H and G? How a smaller can be the maximum matching size between H and G? Additive of alpha. Look at the matching between them. There is this alpha n size. Suppose the gap between them is more than alpha n. So there is this alpha n size matching that you've not picked, but you should have picked at least one edge from. So for instance, if you have something like this, the maximum matching between G and H are different by an additive factor of alpha n. In fact, this is a stronger. This, quant, this matching cover gives you exactly the same thing as matching as sparsifier as Aaron was talking about, okay? If you have a matching cover like this between any two sets of vertices, you preserve the matching within an additive factor of alpha. I'm not proving that, I leave it as an exercise. It follows directly from the generalized Hall's theorem that Aaron defined. Okay. This, is, this is just a different way of writing what is a matching sparsifier. Okay, good. Any question about this? Now, finding matching covers is an algorithmic question. Suppose you don't know anything about RS graph, forgot anything I told you about RS graph. If I give you this problem, this is, this is the same as a spanner problem, the same as cut sparsifier, fault torrent, I don't know, something. This is a graph G, I put a graph G in front of you. You want to pick an alpha matching cover from it. Make sense? Okay. And if you can find it, you'll get some good object. It, it will give you the sparsifier, for instance. Any question about this problem? Just want to make sure Z here is a tripartite. Z here is a bipartite. Yeah, yeah, for now it is bipartite, yes. For general, actually, you have to, here you have to be a bit more careful how you define this thing. So let's just uh, stick with bipartite graphs. Good. So does this algorithmic question make sense? I give you graph G, re, a parameter alpha, return a matching cover of G and alpha. As an algorithmic question, does anyone see how you can solve this problem? Pick a random subset. So that's, that's an approach. It doesn't work well, really. Like, um, Matching is very sensitive in some sense. Like random sampling tend to destroy matching a lot. Okay. Um, let me give you a, an algorithm for this. I will just write a linear program. Okay, and I'll, and I'll use that. Okay. So what is a linear program here? Let me write the primal LP. Minimize. So I wrote the following exponential size linear program. I have, a rand I have a variable for each edge of my graph. I want to pick my edges such that, what is my condition? 
whenever there is two sets of, look at each large matching in my graph. From the edges that are between its endpoints, I want to have picked at least one. Does this linear program make sense? It's not a good linear program. It's like exponential size. Okay? It's in fact a very bad program. Even solving it, uh, you cannot even solve it with ellipsoid, at least in a trivial way. Okay? Because its separation oracle requires you to solve an independent set problem. Okay? So uh, I don't know how to solve this LP. Okay? But I can write it. No? I'm not going to ever solve this LP. I'm going to just use all of it in for my analysis, really. Okay? Um, yeah. Okay, good. But does the LP make sense? Good. Okay. So let's do something fun. By the way, I'm not claiming that solving this LP is MP hard or hard. I don't know that. Okay? Um, we thought about it at different occasions. It might be doable. Okay? But I don't know. Good. But let's write some claim here. Some claim one. Suppose I solve this LP. Okay. Do you see how to get a matching cover after I solve this LP? Okay. Let me ask a different question. How many of you know what is set cover problem? I'm going to wait. I give you more time. Like, how many of you know what is set cover problem? We, we know. Okay, good. So, how do you solve set cover? You write a linear program for it. Okay, go ahead. Can you just take the set of edges which have like at least one half weight? Good. So, that's one way of doing this thing. That will give you. So, one way is to solve this LP and then just deterministically round it. Okay? But if you know set cover, what is another way of rounding this thing? Okay? This is a set cover LP. Your sets are the edges, and your elements are these matchings. Okay? So you can write it, and then you have to sample based on log of the universe size. Okay? And log of the universe size is the number of these matchings is at most how many, like alpha n you can pick. Okay? So, Size of matching cover is less than or equal to order log of n choose alpha n times opt of LP. Do you agree with this? So I solve my linear program, and I sample each of the edges with probability I of xe times this quantity. And this quantity is roughly alpha n log 1 over alpha times opt of LP. Good. So this is one side of this thing. So my matching cover, I can bound it. Because this was a fractional solution, I can bound an actual matching cover by this quantity. Good? Does anyone see where I'm going with this? What is my goal? I want to tell you that the matching cover, I want to, my eventual goal is to bound matching cover in terms of RS graph. In fact, my goal is to show you that matching cover and RS graph are the same thing. Like MC of N and alpha is roughly the same as RS of alpha N and N. So define MC of alpha and N. This is size of the best matching cover of with parameter alpha. Okay? Let's do a, first a simple observation. MC of alpha and n is larger than or equal to up to some constant RS of alpha n and alpha plus a small of 1 and n. So first matching 
matching cover is a slightly larger than the RS graph. Okay, this is, uh, does someone see this? Okay, I, I think I should have done this thing before. So this is the same argument as the fault tolerant matching. Why? Pick an, pick an RS graph. How do you pick with induced matching of size alpha n? It's slightly larger than alpha n, okay? You have to pick lots of edges from each of its induced matchings, okay? Otherwise, you cannot cover the endpoint of that matching. That means you have to pick a lot of edges. So this part is, this is weak duality type. Yeah, so, yeah, alpha of this thing times n and n. Yes, you're right. Okay. How large is alpha? For now, think of alpha being constant. For any constant alpha. If it's not constant, uh, some of these things change a bit. So think of... This quantity? But this is how you get it, no? This bound, log of this thing is n over alpha n to the power alpha n. Okay, so yeah, I skipped some part super fast. I forgot about this thing to show you. This is a weak duality part. RS graphs are always a lower bound for matching covers, okay? They tell you that your matching cover cannot become better than RS graph. This is weak duality. What I want to get at is actually this thing is also upper bounded by RS of alpha minus a small of one and n. Okay, again, this thing is like times n. So matching covers on RS graphs are roughly the same thing, like in an extremal sense. The worst case of a matching cover is like upper bounded by an RS graph. Okay, good. This is a result of GKK12. And because we don't have time, let me just tell you quickly how you get from here, okay? So this was the primal LP that I wrote, okay? Just quickly, let's look at the dual LP. The dual is to minimize summation these ABs, YAB, subject to for all HE summation E summation AB that contains E, YAB less than or equal one. This is the dual of this LP. You are picking matchings such that each edge is covered by just one matching. Okay? Suppose you were solving this LP integrally. What does this mean? Pick bunch of matching so that each edge, these are not edges that are part of the matching. These are edges that are in the subgraph induced by the matching. If you were solving this matching integrally, so if you are solving this LP integrally, what do you get? You pick bunch of matchings. Each edge is induced inside those matchings. This will give you RS graph. Any integral solution to this problem will give you an RS graph. Does that make sense? Okay. So the primal was matching cover. The dual is trying to extract the RS graph from inside your input. Yes. Thank you. This is a packing problem. There is a caveat here to get this result. The thing is that, again, duality only happens in the fractional world. You are not solving this thing integrally. And the other problem is that packing LPs do not have a good integrality gap, okay? But they have a good boy criteria integrality gap. By that, I mean you can satisfy large number of constraints 
and picking a lot of things integrally. Okay? And that's how you lose this factor. So you can actually show that you can use a fractional solution to that and turn it into an RS graph by losing this factor. And that will give you an upper bound. So matching covers are like sandwich between these two values of RS graph, which tell you something good. This was like, this is a matching a sparsifier or anything. In some sense, it is telling you that you can, you never have to pay more than the density of RS graphs, okay? And that's why if you are like very desperate, like we were in that paper, because we wanted to just break something, you can use density of RS graphs, okay? To get a slightly better upper bounds, okay? But the thing is that it's like conditional. If somebody can improve these things much further, you will get better upper bounds in those results as well. Where do I use what? The same cover, the half line of Ah, so. So the matching cover here also, both of them will, so matching cover was upper bounded by this thing. And the dual will give you the number of matchings you pick. This is like, you know, you pick zero or one. The density get multiplied by alpha n. So RS, you know, basically the value of the LP is, the, is T, is the number of matchings you pick, okay? So opt of prima, opt of dual is upper bounded by RS of alpha minus a small of one and N divided by alpha N. And then you plug these two things together, you make these two equal, your matching cover will become upper. These two cancel out, there is this log one over alpha extra term, which I'm hiding here. Good. All right, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you everyone for sticking till the end. LP, the dual, is the number of matchings you pick. Okay? Like maximum, you are picking number of matchings. So number of, so on this side, there's like, the number of edges that I have is alpha n times opt of LP. The integrality gap times opt of LP. So these are the number of edges in my matching cover. My dual value is upper bounded by this quantity, Rs divided by alpha n. Okay? So this alpha n, when I multiply by this, they cancel out each other. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's a bunch of different areas of applications, but what about the problems? Like snatching was mentioned. Oh, good. Like okay. So yeah, so this line of work actually, at least uh, here, almost none of these things are about matchings. Like the information theory one is about communication over shared channels, for instance. Property testing is for testing hereditary graph properties, has nothing to do with matching. Approximation algorithm for is a lower bound for a Steiner tree, like some sort of relaxation of a Steiner tree. NOF, nothing to do with matching. Here, these were for approximate matching a streaming lower bounds. More recently, there was another line of work that has start using. So the first type of work, they were proving a streaming lower bounds using RS graphs for approximate matching. 
There is an entirely different way of using RS graph. It's for a sort of a hardness amplification. RS graph have lots of induced matching inside them. You can use each induced matching to embed a hard problem there. Roughly speaking, this line of work says that if you have a lower bound for a sparse graph, you can plug it into RS graph and make it sufficiently hard for dense graph. And more recently, there's some work that combine both of these things. So you use both application of RS graph to prove a streaming lower bound for multi-pass matching, for instance. Yes. Good. So, okay, let me see if I understood the question correctly. So we write the LP for a fixed graph G. That's true. And the dual is also picking from a fixed graph G. Okay? We are saying that, and you are right, in the analysis, we are kind of ignoring the graph G. We are bounding this thing by the worst possible G that can be. Okay? This is an upper bound argument, no? So it doesn't matter what is G. We are saying no matter how complicated G it is, okay, we can still get an RS graph out of it. Okay? If this value is large, I can get a large RS graph from my graph G. Okay? So some large RS graph sits inside G. The only way for this value to be large is that there is an RS graph inside it. Okay? And in fact, that's the open problem I want to talk about here is about this question. Existence of a large RS graph is a necessary condition for this LP to be large, but it's not sufficient. Why? Click has a very large RS graph inside it, but its matching cover LP is very small. Okay? So I want to understand what is the sufficient condition as well. Thanks for